Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it, and without further ado, let's go. Back in my army days, I was once in command of a unit of about 80 soldiers in Hawaii. Most of the soldiers in my command were great people, happy to do their jobs and take home a paycheck. They were hard workers, creative, adaptable to unusual army conditions, and generally reliable. However, there was one who was troubled from the start, gentle reader, meet Private Wiggles. My first awareness of Wiggles came two or three days after I'd taken over command of the unit, when I was told Wiggles might not be able to go, as she'd just had an outpatient medical procedure. Departure was about a week away, and I had to validate the personnel roster to make sure we had logistical support for everyone we were bringing, transportation, food, lodging, etc. Wiggles said it wasn't a problem, she could handle it. We got to Thailand and set up camp on a Thai army base. Two days in, the medical section sent a runner to find me. Wiggles was at our medical clinic, laid out with extreme abdominal pain. I went over to the clinic tent, and the physician assistant on duty told me a couple of things. Wiggles had been diagnosed with the single worst case of pelvic inflammatory disease he'd ever seen. Pelvic inflammatory disease can be treated with high-dose antibiotics, which the physician assistant had on hand. Not a problem, we had this covered. Wiggles was released to Sergeant Deb, her section sergeant, who would make sure Wiggles took her antibiotics and keep an eye on her for any further issues. Sergeant Deb found me and First Sergeant Bob about a day later and told me two more things about Wiggles. She was refusing to take her antibiotics and she wanted to get out of the army. I again talked with Wiggles. Me. So you want out of the army? You know you have a couple of years left on your contract, right? Wiggles. I know, but I'm just done being a soldier, and I want to be out of the army. Me. Okay, I can make that happen. You don't want to be here, then I don't want you here either. But here's the deal. You have to play by the rules. I can get you out with an honorable discharge, and I'll start the paperwork as soon as we're back in Hawaii but you need to take your antibiotics, do your job, and be where you're supposed to be. You do your part and I'll do my part for you. Sounds good? Wiggles. Yep, I can do that. Spoiler alert. She couldn't do that. For the rest of the Thailand exercise, Sergeant Deb had to take control of Wiggles' medications and force her to take them. When she could actually find Wiggles, who consistently found someplace else to be, at one point in the next week or so, she accused First Sergeant Bob of assaulting her, easily disproved as he didn't have her infection. She was just trying to stir up trouble with wild accusations, I guess. We got back to Hawaii, and I started the process to get her out of the army, because as much as she'd been a handful of trouble in Thailand, I was thinking it was still easier at this point to release her than it was to keep her around and punish her before letting her go. I was wrong. Even as I started to work on her discharge, she ramped up the foolishness. Here are a few examples. Wiggles got caught drinking. She was only 19 years old. Wiggles and her husband lied to the on-base housing office and provided forged authorization documents to get into rent-free on-base housing that they didn't qualify for. Wiggles refused to show up for work or any unit formation and couldn't be found anywhere for days. Here's a weird one. I got a call from a temp agency asking me if it was okay for Wiggles to continue working through them as an administrative assistant for clients in town. It's not uncommon for soldiers to have a second job. But with everything else she was up to at the time, this one just had me going, what in the world? There's more, but you get the idea. At this point, Wiggles' actions were egregious enough that I could no longer just release her with an honorable discharge. I put her on notice that she was at risk for a court-martial. I thought that threat might keep her in line, but she just couldn't seem to stop herself from getting more and more foolish. It's the old 80 20ths problem. 80% of your time is spent dealing with the 20% of your folks who are troublemakers. At this point, I was wasting a not insignificant amount of time dealing with Wiggles' issues almost daily. I had genuinely and in good faith offered her the easy path. But I guess she figured she'd try to burn the place down on the way out, 
since she apparently thought she was getting what she wanted no matter what she did. I was reminded of what my old platoon sergeant used to say when I was coming up through the ranks. You want to get foolish? Go ahead, but I can get more foolish. Cue the consequences. She was causing me daily headaches, so I was going to bring the pain back to her. Honorable discharge paperwork was out the window, and I leaned into the special court-martial process instead. My legal counsel told me that Wiggles' activities were likely to get her a couple of weeks' confinement at most, maybe not even that, she might get a monetary fine, and she'd probably get an other than honorable discharge, potential for a bad conduct discharge, which is worse, but while her actions had been not that good, they also were not that bad. I was rational enough to understand that. I had a brief chat with Captain Morgan, Wiggles' military defense attorney, about where I was going with this case. During our chat, I tried to be a gentleman and let him know that Wiggles was going to be trouble for him if he wasn't careful. He gave me a condescending, this isn't my first rodeo, Baca. I'm a big boy and can take care of myself. Fair enough, I tried to warn you. Normally, a soldier getting a special court-martial for minor infractions might get confined to the barracks, restricted to their on-base quarters, or something similar for the duration of the process. It's not like she killed someone, right? However, my military legal counsel dropped this little gem in my ear. He told me Wiggles had met all five of the conditions, danger to others, flight risk, etc., required by military law, uniform code of military justice, to warrant requesting confinement prior to her trial. He told me, if you can remember these five conditions and elaborate on the details at our next pretrial meeting with the military magistrate, you might be able to get her confined to the Navy brig at Ford Island until the trial. I'm a guy who likes to pay attention to sound legal advice, so I did just as he said. A couple of days later, we went in for the pre-trial meeting, and I ran down the list for the magistrate. Boom. The magistrate ordered Wiggles to be confined in the brig through the trial. First Sergeant Bob and Platoon Sergeant Maggie went to pick her up from her on-base housing. She wouldn't open the door, but they knew she was inside because they could clearly hear her and Mr. Wiggles being intimate. This is important for later. The Wiggles finished up, she took her time getting showered and dressed, and finally came to the door when it pleased her. Off she went to the brig. The pretrial processes took up the next four weeks. During that time, I had to deal with Captain Morgan, the paralegals in his office, and various fun things to do with her pending court-martial. Other than that, it was blissfully peaceful. Wiggles relaxed in the brig for four weeks, seriously relaxed. Every time I had to visit, it was freezing in there. I was required to make weekly welfare visits to see if she was being mistreated, if she had any needs that weren't being met, etc. It seems weird, but as her commander, I was still responsible for making sure the brig staff weren't mistreating my soldier. Other goings on in this time period, Mr. Wiggles fraudulently applied for a car loan and got a van in their names. Mr. Wiggles was dishonorably discharged and kicked off the island. He flew home to wherever he originally enlisted from. Captain Morgan asked me to consider an other than honorable discharge and time served in lieu of taking things all the way to trial. I was eager to get that pound of flesh from her, but my legal counsel advised me to avoid the court-martial and just release Wiggles with the other than honorable discharge. After all, he said, she's already been locked up for almost three weeks, so the magistrate will probably just give her time served and the other than honorable anyway. See my earlier comment about sound legal advice. My boss, Lieutenant Colonel Ryan, thought I was too invested in the case, that I was no longer objective. Lieutenant Colonel Ryan insisted on coming with me to the brig for the next welfare visit. This was three weeks into Wiggle's stay in those luxurious accommodations. Among other lines she threw at us, Wiggles told us she needed to see the dentist about a filling that was giving her trouble, and Motrin just isn't working. At the end of the visit, Lt. Col. Ryan told the guards about Wiggles' filling, asked if they could give her anything stronger than Motrin, then instructed them to follow up with the dentist. The guard actually laughed out loud at this and said, No sir, Motrin is the best we can do in the brig. 
and that other thing, for the last two weeks, she's been telling anyone with ears that she wants to try getting her wisdom teeth pulled before she's released. She doesn't have a problem with any fillings. It was hilarious to watch Lieutenant Colonel Ryan's face go from obvious concern for Wiggle's well-being to outright fury, and the next words out of his mouth were, that troublemaker lied to me. I made arrangements with Captain Morgan to accept his request for time served and other than honorable discharge in lieu of court-martial. Sometime later that week, I got a call from the brig. Wiggles was pregnant. Remember the scene at her house four weeks prior and they couldn't keep her confined anymore because of it. She had to be released back to her unit until the court-martial or other actions were complete. Captain Morgan staked his reputation on Wiggles being a good girl until we could send her back home to Carolina. He'd come to regret that, and he couldn't say I didn't warn him. We got Wiggles back from her four-week all-inclusive stay in the brig. I'd accepted Captain Morgan's request to avoid the court-martial and I confined Wiggles to the barracks under supervision for the nine days she had left until her flight to Carolina. Immediately, we had another crazy show. Wiggles was smoking in the barracks. Not a big deal that she was smoking, it's just not allowed inside barracks rooms. Wiggles was caught with a bottle of alcoholic beverage in her barracks room. She was still only 19. Wiggles slipped out of the barracks and ran off for a day when her platoon sergeant got distracted from supervising her. First Sergeant Bob and Lieutenant Ricky, the executive officer, went to collect Wiggles' belongings from her on-base housing so we could box it up and ship it to her home, and they found that Mr. Wiggles had left behind a bunch of stuff he stole from other soldiers, body armor, military equipment, and some ammunition, smoke grenades, and explosives that he stole during trips to the range all lined up right inside the front door where it was impossible to miss. They called me, asking what to do. Me. Just collect it all, return the equipment to the central issue facility, and dump the ammunition and explosives in the nearest amnesty box. Mr. Wiggles obviously meant for Wiggles to take the fall for having it. Husband of the year. If we take that bait, Wiggles will be here forever. I don't want that, do you? Lieutenant Ricky. Nope, I don't want that either, it'll be like it never happened. In light of all this drama, I brought Wiggles into my office to remind her of her agreement to be a good girl till she left the island, with Lieutenant Ricky as a witness. Me. Wiggles, you're in violation of your release agreement from the brig. You've been sneaking out of the barracks. You've been smoking and drinking. Wiggles. Yeah, and doing all kinds of illicit substances too, heavy sarcasm voice. Me. Be that as it may, I'm giving you fair warning that you're at risk of losing the deal I made with Captain Morgan. Additionally, you're pregnant again. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but most damage to a fetus from alcohol and smoking will come in the first few weeks after conception. I don't know if you're planning to keep this one or not, but at the rate you're going, this baby's going to be born less intelligent than you. Wiggles was gaping like a fish. Wiggles then bolted out of my office and ran down to Lieutenant Colonel Ryan's office at the other end of the building to complain about me insulting her. Lieutenant Ricky hot on her heels. She tried to rush into Lieutenant Colonel Ryan's office, but Lieutenant Ricky got in first and filled him in. Lieutenant Ricky told me later how it went down. Wiggles was yelling about how I called her unintelligent, strangely vanilla thing to focus on, considering everything she'd done but you do you and that she was being mistreated. Lieutenant Colonel Ryan yelled at his admin to get Captain Morgan on the phone. Now, he berated Captain Morgan for his client's misbehavior, told him to fix this, and made various threats to Captain Morgan's career. About a half hour later, I got a call from Captain Morgan. Captain Morgan, I can't believe the words I'm hearing from Wiggles. I'm shocked that you would use language like that and call her names. Side note. My mom is an attorney, and I grew up knowing that I'm shocked, appalled, and dismayed. It's what they said when they didn't have a good argument. So as soon as I heard the word, shocked, I knew I had the upper hand and immediately cut in. Me. Dot and I bet you're appalled and dismayed too, Captain Morgan. Stumbling and sounding slightly confused, well, yes, of course I am, you can't talk to soldiers like that. I know of a lieutenant colonel, a commander, who called one of her soldiers unintelligent, 
and she's no longer in command now. Me. I didn't call her unintelligent. I informed her of basic biological facts. Not my problem if she takes the news poorly. And arguably she's not all that smart. Anyway, you called me, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't to warn me about what I said to Wiggles. So what do you want, Captain Morgan? What will it take to prevent you from cancelling our deal? Me. You could get her on a plane tomorrow, Captain Morgan. How about if I get her out of here by Friday? It was Wednesday, and she was due to fly out the following Wednesday. Me. I don't think you can manage that, but good on you if you do. To his credit, Captain Morgan got Wiggles a flight for Sunday, three days early. I printed up official orders appointing Lieutenant Ricky as a military escort specifically for her. Lieutenant Ricky drove her to the airport, and the airline desk agent called me to verify his status when they got to the check-in counter. They gave him a special pass to get through security with her. He stayed with her at the gate to make sure she got on and stayed on the plane, then stayed at the gate until the plane was in the air. Some troublemakers are hard to get rid of. We wanted to make absolutely sure this one landed someplace else. About a month later, I got a call from the military police about a derelict van in the parking lot with all four tires slashed. Guess who that belonged to? It's really kind of sad when I look back on it. I had two other soldiers come to me at different points, asking to get out of the army ahead of their contracts. They played by the rules and I got both of them out with honorable discharges and all the benefits. They even qualified for unemployment. Too easy. Wiggles could have had the same treatment. I told her exactly what I could do for her, then had to shift gears and told her exactly what I was going to do to her. Then I did it, that foolish troublemaker. So just some backstory here. My parents divorced when I was just in kindergarten so no more than six. My mom got full custody of us and she suffered from mental illness. I believe she has borderline personality disorder and she was also a typical narcissistic parent. Anyway, ever since the divorce, she would always tell us how it was not her fault we didn't have enough money for things and blame my dad. Example if there was nothing to eat for breakfast and we complained like small children do when they were hungry, she snapped, it's your father's fault so cry to him. I just learned never to complain and do without and spent my childhood taking care of her. My sister and I were trained from when I was about eight, my sister ten, to come right home from school and do our homework and clean the house and take care of ourselves. Don't ask mom to make dinner, make it yourself and all of the chores so mom doesn't have to do anything. It sounds bizarre but we thought that was normal. It got worse my senior year of high school. My grandma died a few months before that summer and my mom quit her job and blew through the money my grandma left her before the summer was over. This was close to 75k back in 2000. She refused to get another job and kept coming up with excuses not to work, i.e., I need a break, get off my back, I hurt my leg, etc., while she was going out drinking with her friend and acting like a carefree teenager. So I spent my senior year working hard at school, at my part-time job after school, and pretty much taking care of an overgrown child who refused to work or help out, any time a utility shut off or there was no food left in the house, she just griped, you have a job, why can't you pay it? If I brought up the fact that my dad sent her child support, she would just complain that she had my sister's tuition, which I later learned it was basically crap. She would flaunt that child support check and laugh and refer to it as mommy's paycheck. Flash forward to when I am about to choose a college and my mom keeps belly aching about the costs and of course has zero saved in a college fund. I couldn't afford a private university since I only was offered a partial scholarship, so I decided to go to a reasonably priced and still highly regarded state university. My freshman year I was pretty much able to swing the cost of tuition and room and board. I lived on campus. Since last year of high school I filed my taxes and FAFSA, free application for federal student aid, as soon as my wage and tax statement came in, so I had a decent amount of grants. During my first year of college, I almost became unable to receive financial aid for my second year of college. Why? My wage and tax statement were mailed to my home address, and my mom being the caring and supportive mother she was, shredded them and threw them in the trash. 
I found out because my sister was home that weekend and saw it. My mom denied and when I came home for spring break and pressed her for it, she lied and said her friend had them. Her friend was a certified public accountant. My sister called my mom out on this bluff by calling the friend who said she did not have any of our tax information. She was very concerned and told me and my sister to request duplicate wage and tax statements and have them sent home and she will have my mom send them over to me. My mom was pissed that we had checked with her friend and called her out on her bluff but true to her word, her friend did my taxes for me and my FAFSA. I had offered to pay her or at least babysit for her but she told me it was okay. I think she knew my mom was mentally unstable and felt sorry for me and my sister. At this point I learned that my mom had not been helping out my sister at all with tuition like she claimed and my sister had mentioned it to my dad, who had called her out, and demanded to know where the child support was going to. My mom insisted he wasn't paying her enough dollar, and that's why she couldn't help us out. During my second year of college, my wage and tax statement were once again sent home and my mom once again accidentally threw them in trash. I had to request duplicate wage and tax statements from my summer job, not just once but twice because she kept throwing them in the trash. I filed my tax return late that year, and as a result my FAFSA was filed late, so I wasn't able to get the full amount I was receiving before. Anytime I complained to her about money or no food in the house it was, complain to your father. Well the summer before my third year I was burned out on my mom's crap. I was working full time for the summer and saving as much as I could but she was refusing to help me out at all while I was home with food or anything. She was pissed that instead of paying the phone bill so she could make long-distance calls to her online friends and spend all day in chat rooms. This was back when we had dial-up. I had the audacity to spend my hard-earned money on a cell phone and pay that bill myself. She told everyone I should just drop out because I wasn't applying myself hard enough. I was in the honors program and she would play martyr with all her friends about it's so hard when you have kids in college and they eat your out of house and home and come to you for money. At the end of the summer I had saved a thousand dollars, but the school won't let me move into the dorm unless I paid 50% up front, which I was about 10k. I didn't know what to do, as all summer the university had told me I was fine, and then on move-in day told me I couldn't move into the dorm. I called my dad in a panic, and he spoke to someone who agreed to give me 24 hours. I moved in, and the next day my dad showed up first thing with a coffee and a donut for me, and told me not to worry. He was going to fix this once and for all. We went from office to office on campus, and he co-signed a loan, which he later paid off for me, and then he paid the balance on my tuition for the loan didn't cover. He then took me out to lunch and told me the truth. My mom never helped my sister with her tuition. My sister had graduated the summer before my junior year of college. My sister later confirmed this but was not surprised my mom had lied. My dad had a co-signed loan to help my sister out, which he later paid off for her too, and my sister was able to get a scholarship and do co-op to pay for her last two years. He also advised me that my mom was not so poorly off. As part of the divorce settlement he had to pay the mortgage and property taxes on our house, and even though my sister was now out on her own, he was still paying her the same amount of child support of about 2k a month, despite the fact that I was living on campus for 75% of the year, and my mom was not giving me a dime. Just to give you some clarification, my tuition and room and board before financial aid kicked in was 15k a year so she could have easily helped me out with school since after financial aid kicked in, when I was able to get it, the balance was usually 6k. I was hurt to think my mom was just living off my child support, and constantly making me feel guilty for wanting anything or for not being able to cater to her every whim. She would get pissed that I wouldn't come home on the weekends to help her clean the house that I was not living in. I thought about how bad she made me feel growing up, and made me feel worthless, when in fact, had it not been for me or my sister, she would have not had a roof over her head after the divorce. He asks me to grant him access to my account so he could prove my mom was not paying for college, and that I was. 
He asked me how I would feel if he took care of college instead of paying my mom child support. Sounded good to me. He even told me I could spend my breaks at his house instead of my mom's. I called my mom and told her that my dad had taken care of the issue, and she had no remorse. She told me it was my own fault for not planning my finances better and for pissing away my money all summer. I just played it dumb and said she was right, but pointed out I had done what she told me to do, and complained to my dad. A month later my mom called me up pissed. My dad had spoken with the courts, and there was going to be a hearing in their divorce case. My dad had proven that my mom had not been paying for mine, nor my sister's tuition for college, and that was the very reason my dad was obligated to pay child support till I was done college. Since I was living on campus, it didn't make sense to pay her child support when I was not living at home most of the year, and she was given me one penny. My dad told the judge he would gladly pay for me to finish college, but he was not going to pay my mom any more child support or pay the mortgage on the house. If my mom didn't want to take over the mortgage, they could sell the house and I could live with him over my breaks. My mom was freaking out over this and calling me selfish. I just reminded her that my tuition must cost a lot more than what she got in child support since she was never able to help me with the costs of school. She just kept laying guilt trips on me about how I was selfish because she didn't get to go to college right after high school and how she never got to have four carefree years of college. I pointed out to her that she had not worked since my grandma died about three years ago and that I was working and going to school at that time while she got to live a carefree life. She pretty much ripped me a new one at that point. She tried to get back at my dad by not paying utilities on the house to make it seem like she needed the money. She then told me that the electric and water were now shut off, so if I wanted to come home for winter break, I needed to help her out. She had moved in with her boyfriend at his condo. I just told her that I would miss her but that I would just go to my dad's for winter break. She was pissed and cried about how selfish I was for not wanting to come home for Christmas. Side note. The Christmas before my present was throwing out many of my personal belongings. Why? My mom was pissed off at me that I didn't want to come home one weekend to help her clean because to get home, I had to take two buses, two trains, spend $20 one way, and wait for her to hopefully remember to pick me up at the train station which was a whole 20-minute drive for her after I had traveled for four to five hours because I had finals, and I told her I would help clean for the holidays once I came home for winter break. Her response? She took all of my things, threw them in boxes and threw them out on the front lawn. Most of my things were destroyed by being left in the rain, and I being away most of them. I told my mom that I would come and visit her over my winter break once she got the utilities turned on. I told my dad what was going on, and he said he and my stepmom and my half-brother and sister were thrilled I was going to stay with them for winter break, and he can get me a job in his office as well for winter break. He also called my mom and reminded her that the child support had not stopped, and they were going to list the house in a few months, so what was this nonsense about the utilities being shut off? She was pissed but magically came up with the money to turn them back on. That spring my dad, officially by the court, took over my college tuition, and he even made sure I got my full financial aid, since he had picked up the wage and tax statement for me. My mom lost her child support, and was told by the judge that she better cooperate with the sale of the house and keep up with the utility bills etc., so it would sell. Her boyfriend moved in with her till the house sold and she moved to another time zone. The real kicker, it was cheaper for my dad to pay college costs than to pay her child support. No regrets. I'm driving home today on a side street. I'm toddling along going the speed limit when a guy suddenly pulls in front of me from a parking space at the curb. He's slow enough and reckless enough where I almost hit him, he had no turn signal on. He seems lost, so I slow way down. He then proceeds in front of me very, very slowly, blocking the flow of traffic, weaving back and forth. He then starts to turn right, so I slow even more. Then he veers very abruptly in front of me, wildly to the left cutting me off completely, so I slam on my brakes and honk my horn once to warn him. This inconsiderate driver stops his car literally sideways in the middle of the street, 
blocking me and blocking traffic in both directions. He then rolls down his window, starts making rude gestures, and commences to scream at me. I just sit there in my car, wondering if he's lost his mind. He then opens his car door, still screaming at me, still making rude gestures, gets out of his car, and starts threatening me with beating me up. I'm a small woman. I calmly pick up my phone, do not roll down my window. My car doors are locked, and I simply and very obviously start recording him. He continues to march up to my car yelling at me. The minute he sees me recording him on my cell phone, he abruptly stops screaming. All at once he becomes as meek as a mouse, then very politely and somewhat bizarrely attempts to explain himself. My window is still up. I am still recording him. When I do not stop recording or put the phone down, do not react to him, and do not say a word, he then turns on his heel, runs to his car, and drives off in the opposite direction like a bat out of hell. Funny how the threat of making an impolite person go viral, possibly lose his job, and expose him to the world, as the impolite person that he is, possibly an intoxicated impolite person, almost immediately altered what could have been a police report, and an assault, into a frightened rabbit turning tail and running away terrified. I never thought I'd be telling this story, but here we are. It's about my girlfriend's son's girlfriend. She's a real piece of work, that one. Just turned 18 a few months back and boy does she love the bar scene. But here's the kicker, she's always broke. So what does she do? She plays this game where she flirts with guys all night getting them to buy her drinks. Then when they ask her to leave with them, she shuts them down cold. Pretty messed up, right? Well, karma finally caught up with her last week. I wasn't there to see it but I heard all about it afterward. Here's how it went down. It was a Friday night, and she strolled into her favorite bar with her friend. They grabbed a table near the dance floor, and she immediately started scanning the room for potential targets. It didn't take long before a group of guys caught her eye. She, hey there, you boys looking to have some fun tonight? Guy one, sure thing, what are you drinking? She, oh I'd love a margarita, you're so sweet. And just like that, the game was on. She spent the next few hours bouncing between these guys, laughing at their jokes, touching their arms, and letting them buy her drink after drink. Her friend was mostly just along for the ride, sipping on the occasional cocktail that came their way. As the night wore on, the guys started getting a bit more forward. One of them leaned in close to her. Guy too. So, what do you say we get out of here? We could continue this party at my place. She. Oh that's so tempting but I can't tonight. I've got an early morning tomorrow. Thanks for the offer though. Guy too. Come on don't be like that. We've been buying you drinks all night. She. And I really appreciate it. But I'm just not interested in going home with anyone tonight. The guys exchanged looks, clearly not happy with the situation. But instead of arguing, they just nodded and headed for the door. She thought she'd won again, smirking to herself as she watched them leave. But then the bartender walked over to their table looking serious. Bartender, excuse me miss, I need to speak with you about your tab. She, my tab, I don't have a tab, those guys were buying my drinks all night. Bartender, well, it seems those gentlemen left without paying, and since the drinks were ordered for you, I'm afraid you're responsible for the bill. Her eyes went wide and her jaw dropped, I wish I could have seen that face, must have been priceless. She, what, no that can't be right, they can't do that. Bartender, I'm sorry, but they did, your total for the night comes to $247.50. She, but I don't have that kind of money, this isn't fair. Bartender, I understand you're upset, but the bill needs to be paid. Do you have another way to cover it? She looked at her friend, panicked, but her friend just shrugged. She didn't have that kind of cash either. She, can I, can I call someone to bring me the money? Bartender, sure, but I'll need to hold on to your ID until the bill is settled. Reluctantly, she handed over her ID and pulled out her phone. I don't know who she called. Probably my girlfriend's son, but I heard she was stuck there for over an hour before someone showed up with the cash to bail her out. When I heard about this the next day, I couldn't help but laugh. It served her right playing games with people like that. I almost wanted to buy those guys around myself for teaching her a lesson. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video don't forget to hit the like button, and subscribe for more captivating stories, share your own experiences and opinions in the comments below, 
and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.